is due, and then I had already got planned to go on vacation for my birthday, so I wouldn't have to be here on my birthday and get some kind of birthday to that was really <laughs> But uh, I um, had a good time. I went to the beach, and I don't use a lot of the beach, but I decided to go there because you can't really go to a bunch of other places to go on vacation. So I only went for a couple days, and I got a room where uh, outside the room there was a pool and then the beach. I thought, oh, this would be a nice relaxing time. Well, there are all kinds of families from all over the place with all their youngins that was there. And they all were in the pool until about 10 o'clock at night screaming and yelling and everything. So I just had a great time. <laughs> they reminded me of Bushnell Elementary School actually when I was there. But I appreciate Cameron filling in while I was gone. He did a great job on well, I know he did, I was listening to it. And uh, also, um, I wanted to remind you that tonight we have a missionary from Israel scheduled to be here. Um, there was a little hiccup with that this morning, but as far as I know, we're still going to have him here, so we hope that he can be here. But tonight, we'll be meeting regardless, and we hope to hear um, from Brother Kyle Foster, who's going to be one of the as a missionary. If you'd find your Bible and turn to the book of Ruth, chapter 4, the book of Ruth, chapter 4, we're going to be continuing our study there in the book of Ruth on Ruth and the Kinsman Redeemer. And today, I would like to speak to you very much on a personal level about your kinsman redeemer. Jesus Christ, remember we talked about this, is our kinsman redeemer. And today, as we look at the conclusion of these four chapters that make up the book of Ruth, we're going to see some wonderful truths about our Lord Jesus Christ, how he became or is our kinsman redeemer, and what changes that has brought about in our life. So since it's been two weeks, uh, actually technically three, since we've studied in the book of Ruth, I'm going to remind you of the two phrases that I had to repeat often. Some of been here, so this will be a good, uh, good update. But the first one was, I ask you to say, I am Ruth, because if you read the book of Ruth and you really want to understand how it applies to you, then you need to say, I am Ruth. And I really hate when people mess with the sound line, because I thought it was something wrong with me. Uh, I am Ruth. So say that with me. I am Ruth. The second one is, Jesus is my Boaz. Jesus is my Boaz. If you'll remember those two truths when reading the book of Ruth, it will really help you understand all of how all of this real, real old story, but true story, about the book of Ruth and how it applies to you and me. You may remember that when we began in the book of Ruth, it did not start with a happy story. In fact, it was very depressing. The book begins with uh, Elimelech, who is Ruth's father-in-law, leaving uh, Israel and going to a place he had no business going to Moab. And there his two sons married Moabite women, which was a no-no in Jewish tradition. And then Elimelech and ultimately his two sons all die. And so now we have a story where there are three widows in the midst of a famine there in Moab. And so Naomi tries to say goodbye to the two Moabite women that are her daughter-in-law and go back to Israel. But one of them says, no, where you go, I will go. Where you will be, I will be. Your people will be my people, and my God will be your God. The life-changing decision that Ruth made to go and follow the God of Israel. So she went with Naomi, and Orpah went back to the Moabite people. And we find that in chapter 2 that uh, Ruth is out trying to find something to eat. She's gleaning in the fields, and lo and behold, she gleans in the field of a man by the name Boaz, a very wealthy man. He sees her one day, just happens to pass through, and I say happen very loosely there because it's all God's set up and providence. And he sees her, says, wow, this is a, a beautiful woman. Who is she? And he gets introduced to her, and she's, he tells her, don't you believe in anybody else's field? You just get all you want right here. And, of course, I'm paraphrasing in Casey's version. You'll get that, right? And then <laughs> chapter 3, we find that she goes in and meets Boaz at the threshing floor and introduces herself officially and says, sir, if you would, would you be my kinsman and redeemer? We find out that Boaz is, in fact, a wealthy man. He is a kinsman to Elimelech and thus has a uh, genetic right to be a kinsman redeemer. And in chapter 4, we're going to find that the book of Ruth began with the funerals of three men, and it's going to end with the wedding of Ruth and Boaz. And let me tell you, your eternity is going to begin with a funeral, <laughs> but it's going to end... Uh, continue actually all the way through eternity with the wedding of you to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what it all is. Amen. Then we also know that all through this time there is a famine, but this book is going to end with Ruth being full, not only physically, but spiritually. There's a great time of fulfillment in her life. So let's read the entire chapter. It's just 22 short verses. And then we're going to look at the story, Your Kinsman Redeemed. 
Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there. And behold, the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he said, O oh, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Just to stop for a moment, there is a, at the end of chapter 3, a person who was closer kin to Ruth than Boaz. And Boaz is talking to this man and says, Will you be the kinsman redeemer? That's where this is starting. And he took ten men, very important, of the elders of the city, and said, Sit ye down here. And they sat down. And he said unto the kinsman, Naomi, that has come out of the country of Moab, selleth the parcel of land which was of which was our brother Elimelech. <laughs> and I thought to advertise thee, saying, Buy it before the inhabitants and before the elders of my people. If thou wilt redeem it, redeem it. But if thou wilt not redeem it, then tell me that I may know. For there is none to redeem it beside thee, and I am after thee. And he said, I will redeem it. Then said Boaz, What day thou buyest the field of the hand of Naomi, thou must buy also of Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar mine own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to thyself, for I cannot redeem it. By the way, this man who ended up not being the kinsman redeemer, as soon as he found out that Ruth was not an Israeli, that, he was, that she was a Moabite, he said, oh no, no, I can't do that. Keep that in mind. Now this was the manner in former time in Israel concerning redeeming, <coughs> concerning changing, for to conform all things. A man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was a testimony in Israel. Therefore the kinsman said unto Boaz, buy it for thee, so he drew off his shoe. And Boaz said unto the elders and to all the people, You are witnesses this day, that I have bought all that was Elimelech's, and all that was Chilion's and Malon's of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, you, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is coming to my house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in a pathra, and be famous in Bethlehem. And let thy house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, of the seed which the Lord hath give, shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in on her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And the woman said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which has not left me this day without a kinsman, that his name should be famous in Israel. And he shall be unto thee a restorer of thy life, and a nourisher of thine old age, for thy daughter-in-law which loveth thee, which is better to thee than seven sons hath borne him. And Naomi took the child, and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse unto him. And the woman, and the, and the women, excuse me, her neighbors, gave it a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they called his name Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these are the generations of Pharaohs. Pharaohs begat Hezron, and Hezron begat Ram, and Ram begat Amenadab, and Amenadab begat Nashon, and Nashon begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Boaz, and Boaz begat Obed, and Obed begat Jesse, and Jesse begat David. Fast forward to Matthew chapter 1, you find the same lineage there, and it ends. With the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod. This profound story in the Old Testament is a reminder to us that we have a kinsman redeemer, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Would you join me in prayer? Father God, we thank you for your word. We ask now that as it's preached, you teach us, and that all of us might fall more in love today with the Lord Jesus than we were when we entered this place earlier. Father, may we appreciate Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. May we know all that he's done for us, his worthiness to be our Redeemer, his great uh, purchasing price that he did to buy us out of the sin that we were in. And Lord, may we rejoice in where he has restored and renewed us to as redeemed people of God. If there is someone here today who's never trusted Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray they might do so today before they leave this place. We pray that Jesus Christ. Is it just me or is there a great hum in the speakers? Yeah. There's a hum in the speakers. All right. I don't know what I did earlier, but I didn't touch anything. <laughs> if we look at this story this morning, we find that it is actually a beautiful, beautiful reminder 
of what Jesus Christ has done for us as our kinsman redeemer. When we look at the passage of scripture, there are a couple of things that immediately kind of pop off the page, so to speak, about this story. First of all, this story and this passage, chapter 4, mentions the word redeem over 15 times in its writing. He reminds us what it cost. He reminds us what it took for Ruth to be redeemed from her situation and ultimately what you and I uh, had, to, what, what took us to be redeemed from our situation. So notice, first of all, and by the way, I made these points today very personal for a reason. I want you to personally think, as you are Ruth in this story, and Jesus is your Boaz, I want you to think personally what it took for Jesus to redeem you, and what it cost for Jesus to redeem you, and who it was, more importantly, that has redeemed you. And I hope you love Jesus more today than when you walked in the room as I prayed earlier. I really mean that. So first of all, let's look at your redeeming Lord. Would you look at that with me for just a moment? Your redeeming Lord. We're going to focus on verses 1 through 6. Notice that it says that Boaz went to the gate. I just want to stop for a moment and mention that there are two laws in the Old Testament that had to be fulfilled or met, two requirements might be a better statement, in order for someone to be a kinsman redeemer. And only certain people could be a kinsman redeemer. For the sake of time, you'll be glad I'm not going to read Leviticus chapter 25 and Deuteronomy chapter 25 to you today. But you'll be able to go back and read and study them on your own because they're very important. But in Leviticus 25, we have a law that's referred to as the law of the kinsman redeemer by some. Jot that down in your margin. Leviticus 25. In ancient Israel, God would give land to a tribe and to a family. In fact, we read that in the book of Joshua and other places where he gave land to different tribes. And the, if the landowner lost the land or had to mortgage it or somehow went bankrupt or had to sell it, there was a, a way made through this law, Leviticus 25, that someone could come along, a kinsman redeemer, and could buy the land back and give it back to the person that originally owned it. The second law is the law of Levi marriage. The law of the Levi marriage basically says that if a widow has lost her husband and has no children, her husband has died, that the man's brother was to take the man's wife, who has now who is now a widow, and could marry her and endeavor to have children in order to keep the man's name alive. Let me put this in modern Sumner County, Lake County terms. <laughs> Brother-in-law. If that, if your sister's wife, excuse me, your sister's husband dies, you got to marry your sister-in-law. <laughs> I thought that hit like a ton of bricks. It wasn't a requirement, but you kind of were expected to do this to take care of her. Boy, this now sounds a little bit more of an interesting story, doesn't it? Can you imagine that your sister uh, sister dies, and so you now are, are, are expected to marry, as the kinsman redeemer, uh, your sister-in-law, and y'all are not only that, but you're supposed to, because they didn't have any kids, you're supposed to have kids so that the name of your brother continues on. This was an interesting scenario that we see here in the book of Ruth. When we find this, we also find that there is another truth to be found here that is very important. In order to be a kinsman redeemer, you had to meet certain, basically, legal qualifications under Jewish law. The first one was you had to be the legal worthy person that could be the kinsman redeemer. You had to have the right legal qualifications. You had to be a near kinsman. Now, interestingly enough, there is a person in this story at the end of chapter 3, in the beginning of chapter 1, we, or chapter 4, we find him. There was a person who was apparently of closer kin um, to Ruth than Boaz was. I don't know what kin it was. That's not real clear in the passages. But apparently he had more legal rights than maybe Boaz might have had. And so we find that Boaz goes to him and says, Do you want to be, that's what basically verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 are about, Do you want to be the kinsman redeemer? And at first it appears he might want to be. But after a little bit farther in the story, we realize he does not want anything to do with this situation. We don't know why that is, but there's a picture here of something very important. I want you to think about this for one quick moment. I want you to think about the fact that there is a picture here of the law of the Lord, 
of the law of the Lord from the Old Testament. Have you ever thought about, have you ever really thought about that there are people who go around today proclaiming that they are going to follow God's law? And that's how they're going to get into heaven. Ever heard someone say that before? My goodness, how crazy they are. Really, they're fools when it comes to the Bible because they don't understand Scripture at all. When you look at God's Word and you look at the law of God, there is no man that is justified by works of the law. The Bible plainly says that. Here in the gate, notice that Boaz calls together ten witnesses. When you think of God's law, you don't normally think of the 636 laws that are found in the Old Testament. You usually think of only ten. And those ten are what we call the ten, ten commandments. Y'all are doing good today. Those ten commandments usually are what we've kind of boiled down to the gist, the gist of the law of God. How many witnesses did Boaz call to the gate? Ten. Isn't that interesting? And when he gets these ten witnesses here, he then is talking to the man who could be the kinsman redeemer. And in my personal opinion, I think this represents the law of God. And he calls them up and says, hey, are you going to be the kinsman redeemer of Naomi and Ruth or not? And he says, well, he kind of hem hauls around a little bit and says, because Boaz says, well, if you don't want to be, I want to be. And when the man finds out that Ruth is a Moabite, that she is accursed of God. In fact, we took this and looked at this a little bit in detail a, a few weeks ago. When she finds out that, or he finds out that she is <coughs> a, uh, a Moabite woman. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 3 says the Ammonite and the Moabite are to be a curse and they can't enter into the congregation of Israel up to the 10th generation. He finds out that his sister-in-law, so to speak, is a, is a Moabite and he says, I'm not going to risk that. And then she, he finds out how much money, how much cost it's going to take to get this land. And he says, oh, I don't know about this. I might put all of my family in bankruptcy if I dare be the kinsman redeemer. So he says, Boaz, you go ahead and do it. And Boaz gladly does. Where I'm getting at with this is this. The law of God did not, did not have the power to redeem. The law of God couldn't pay the price to redeem. The law of God cannot save anyone. And the book of Ruth reminds every Jew and every Gentile that you cannot be saved by following the works of the law. It reminds us that there had to be someone else who was a kinsman, who could come along and say, I have the wealth, I have the authority, I have the kinship, I have the power, and I'm going to pay the price so that these folks, Naomi and Ruth particularly, can be redeemed. What a wonderful picture that is. Amen? Amen. When we look further into this story, we find that not only do they have to have a legal qualification, you also have to have the money to do it. You have to have the money to be able to buy it, and you have to be willing to do it. Some of y'all cringe when I mentioned earlier that if your sister died, you had to marry your, uh, uh, your brother-in-law. Brother died, you had to marry your sister-in-law. Some of you kind of went, uh, uh, to think about that. But it was also something you had to willingly do. The law did not force you to do so, but it was kind of expected in society of that day that you would do just that. And this first man is not willing, not only not able, but not willing to be the kinsman redeemer for Ruth. So here comes Boaz on the scene. With that said, I want you to notice a couple things about Boaz just for a moment. First of all, Boaz was the person in legal worth to be able to, to be the kinsman redeemer. Notice verse number six for a moment. And the kinsman said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Redeem thou my right to myself, for I cannot redeem it. This man, the second person, the, really the person closest in the family, had no authority, had no power to be able to be the kinsman redeemer. He was not worthy to because he didn't want to, but he was also not able to. So along comes Boaz, and Boaz is the near kinsman that is able to save. And then notice verse number two talks about the ten elders that I mentioned earlier in my summary of the story. He has them be the witnesses that testify that only... Boaz is going to be able in this situation to be the kinsman redeemer. The only thing, the only person, the only one that can save you is Jesus Christ and his shed blood. He is your redeemer, the kinsman redeemer. Hebrews chapter 2 summarizes this for us and says this, For as much sin as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. Have you ever thought about what Jesus did when he went to the cross?
to redeem us. What he destroyed was the power and the bondage of Satan. What he did was pay the price for our sin, and he did it with his own blood. Not only do we see that as Jesus being willing to be the kinsman redeemer, but we also see that he is absolutely worthy. Many people, especially here lately, love the book of Revelation. They've been focusing on it and saying all this COVID stuff is all part of Revelation. You can bind all that if you want. But there's nothing left to be fulfilled in Revelation that's not been done before the return of the Lord Jesus Christ for his children. I'll just say that real clear. But I want you to know this. When we look at the book of Revelation, a lot of people focus on the Antichrist, and some people focus on Armageddon, and some people focus on the, the number of the name 666, and get all hung up in all those things. I like the book of Revelation for a whole different reason. I like the fact that in that book, Jesus Christ is lifted up. He is exalted. And we find when it's all said and done that Jesus Christ is a victor. If you're on his side, that you win. Amen. 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 Revelation chapter 5 talks about the fact that there is a situation in heaven that John sees where the title book to the earth has to be opened and for the rest for the rest of the plagues and things that come out of the, the seven trumpets, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls come to pass in Revelation. Just pick up with me in Revelation 1, 5 through, or 1 through 9 and you'll catch on. And I saw in the right hand of him, this is John speaking, that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside, that's that book I mentioned, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. Notice that word, who is worthy, who has the right, who has the authority to do it. And then he goes on to say, and no man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I wept much because no man was found worthy to open and read the book, neither to look near on. Let me translate this into a simpler language. Basically what that means is nobody dead nor alive had the authority to open the book that he was holding. The Bible says that John wept and the angel said, don't you weep? Then it gets wonderful. He says, weep not, the elder said, behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed. Past tense, by the way, prevailed to open the book and to loose the seventh seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne and the four beasts in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth unto all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And get this, and they sung a new song. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. The title deed of the earth can only be opened by one who is worthy. And who is the one that it was that was worthy? The lion of the tribe of Judah, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. It's not other friend than Jesus Christ, the worthy kinsman redeemer. The only one that could redeem, redeem Ruth. Uh, in this situation was Boaz. He had the authority. He had the worth. He had the wealth, which we're about to talk about, and he also had the will. Notice also that Boaz was a very wealthy person. In Ruth chapter 2 and verse number 1, he is described as a great man of wealth. In fact, you read the verse, and Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. We find that he has multiple fields, hundreds of workers. He is a very wealthy man. Your Redeemer also not only is the Lamb that was slain who's worthy to be your kinsman Redeemer, but your Redeemer Jesus is also very wealthy. Did you know that? The Bible describes him owning the cattle on a thousand hills, hills, which in those days was a man of tremendous wealth, if you owned all that. When we look at Scripture, we find that the great wealth is not found in possessions, but it's found in what Jesus gave so that we could be redeemed. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, notice these verses with me. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things that pass away and rock like silver and gold, from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with what? But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 7 says this, In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of His grace. Have you ever thought, friend, the price that was paid to redeem you took the precious blood of the Lamb of God, the Christ Jesus our Lord? 
The price that was paid to redeem Ruth and all of that that her family had lost was a great price. But Boaz had the wealth. And aren't you glad today that there's enough power in the blood to redeem you from all the sin that you've ever committed, past, present, and future? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Jesus Christ is worthy and He has the wealth, but He also has the love to do it willingly. That first old guy that Boaz met there at the gate that was closer kin to be the, could have been the kinsman redeemer, he said, I don't want to do it. I don't have the ability. I don't have the authority. I don't have the wealth. And I really don't have the will. I don't want to do it. But there was somebody who stepped up to the scene and says, I will be the redeemer. I will be the one. And the Bible tells us in the book of 1 John that Jesus Christ loved us. We love him because he first loved us. Have you ever thought about the grace that Jesus Christ has shown to us that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He does not love us because we're valuable. Think about this. He does not love us because we're valuable. We're valuable because we're loved of Him. There's a difference. You can't go around saying, God loves me in a bragging manner because it's not really why you're valuable. You're, va or you're valuable because you're loved of Him. Think about that. So, your Redeemer is the first thing we looked at. Now I want you to look for a moment at Ruth's redeemed and renewed life. And I want you to think about your redeemed and renewed life. Look at verse 7 and 8 quickly. Now this manner and former time of Israel concerning redeeming and concerning changing, for to confirm all things, a man plucked off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor. And this was a testimony in Israel. Now, sometimes when I'm reading the Bible and studying, I just laugh out loud. <laughs> There are several instances in Scripture where odd things are mentioned, and this is one of them. In the old tradition, if you were going to give a guarantee of your word, you'd click off your shoe and give it to him. But you know, I think there's more meaning than just that odd tradition. Have you ever thought about that Boaz took the Redeemer's shoes, who could not be the Redeemer? The one unqualified, unable to be the Redeemer? Boaz stood in their shoes and became that person's shoes and became the Redeemer. Who stood in our shoes, so to speak, and stretched out His hands between heaven and earth and died on the cross for us? Who took our place? Who paid the penalty for our sins? It is Jesus Christ who filled their shoes. And you know how my ADD works right now stuck in my head is George John. Who's going to fill their shoes? <laughs> Isn't that crazy? That really is the idea that somebody took his place. Somebody took my place. And his name is our kinsman redeemer, Jesus Christ. Say it with me. I am Ruth. I am Ruth. And Jesus is my Boaz. Jesus. How desperately lost we were and Jesus fulfilled that. Jesus redeemed us from that lostness. Real quick, notice that Ruth was cursed. She was cursed. I mentioned this earlier, being a Moabite. She was an alien from the family of Israel, from the commonwealth of Israel. Not only was she cursed, but we also noticed that she had a present condition where she was crushed. She was poor. She was destitute. She had no hope for today or tomorrow. She didn't know what she was going to do. She was a lot like most of us before we come to know Jesus Christ, before we're saved by our Redeemer. Read Ephesians chapter 1 with me, verse, chapter 2, verses 12 and 13. That at that time, meaning when you were lost, you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise. Her past condemned her, and in her present state, she was also condemned. She was just devastated because of all she had lost and all that it had cost her. And before she came to know Boaz, she had no future either. She was going to be desperate, gleaning in fields, getting uh, just the scraps of society, barely making it, barely getting by, and had no hope as a widow. But now, notice what Paul continues to say. Having no hope and without God in the world, in that same verse. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were sometimes afar off are made nigh by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's there in Ephesians chapter 2. 
If you notice what Christ has done, He has taken us from a lost and a strange condition. Strangers without hope in God in this world have moved us to a place of great hope and great promise. And He did it through the power that He had as our worthy Savior and our willing Savior to die for us and to pay the price for our sins. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. But her future, though it was condemned, and though she had all sorts of things going against her, Boaz came along and purchased and renewed her life. Now many of us, when I read it, I knew some of the feminists in the room today and listening might get all offended about the fact that Boaz purchased a wife. I want you to know something. First of all, we're talking about two totally different cultures. <laughs> two totally different cultures. And I want you to remember that in chapter 3, Ruth went to Boaz and said, will you be my kinsman redeemer? In short story, will you remember me? Will you be my kinsman redeemer? And then the only way that Boaz could be her kinsman redeemer was to pay the price to be it. So he did purchase her, in a sense. What we find is she was glad that he did. I want you to notice quickly your restored legacy. Notice what happens. We started in chapter 1 with Ruth and the death and the famine and all the depression. And we move now to chapter 4 where we find the kinsman redeemer doing what he does best. And that's bringing a life of restoration. Amen. He restores the legacy of Elimelech. He restores Naomi and he restores Ruth. And he brings glory back to the family name. And notice what happens, verses 10 down through the end of the chapter. First of all, Ruth receives the family. Notice verse number 10. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, have a purses to be my wife, there it is, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, and the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren, and from the gate of the palace you are witnesses this day. Don't you know that when you got Jesus Christ, he became your kinsman, redeemer, that you got a family? I'm not talking about your blood, kin. I'm talking about your spirit, kin. <laughs> I'm talking about the family of God. We sing a song from time to time, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Anybody remember that song? I've been washed in the fountain cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this sod. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. You might be a, a widow. You might be a, a, a person who's just lonely, never had a, much of a family to speak up. You didn't have a lot of sisters and brothers, whatever the case may be. I want you to know that when you get the Lord Jesus Christ, you not only get a local family as part of this church, this wonderful church family, but you're also a part and connected with the family of God all over this planet. And guess what? When we get to heaven, we're going to find out just how many kinfolk we really got. Amen. There's going to be people from every tribe and tongue and kindred and nation. We're going to be there with people from all the ages that have been saved. And boy, what a homecoming that's going to be. Amen. Amen. I'll leave out the story I told in the first service. I should never tell y'all that shit. Because I'm not you. I did never like going to family reunions. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Because when I was a little boy, they drug me from family reunion to family reunion. Now I wish I could go back to some of them because most of the people are gone. But they would come up to me and they say, oh, you're this little handsome man. You know what I mean? <laughs> and pinch my cheeks. I do not like my, pin my pinch. My <laughs> cheeks pinch. And I despised having to go. As soon as I could, I'd rip off the tie and run outside and do something else. I played. But I absolutely did not like family reunions. But one day there's kind of one friend that will remind us of what family God has bought us into. What price he paid to get us into the family of God. Ruth has now a family. She's a Moabitess. She's estranged. And now she's a part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. All because of a kinsman redeemer. Then we see that he's, she also received a fortune. <laughs> when she received a kinsman redeemer, she received a family. But she also received a fortune. All of Boaz's wealth she now has to enjoy. Do you know what you have in Christ, my brother and my sister? Everything that is Christ, you now have to enjoy. You are heirs and joint heirs with the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 8, Romans 8, 17 says, And if children, which we are as born-again Christians, then heirs, and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with Him, that we may also be glorified together. Joint heirs literally means to share and share alike. Everything that Christ has, He now says, is also yours, because you are mine. What a thought. Not only did she get a family, and not only did she get a fortune, she also got fame. And I had a little struggle with this one, but it actually says that in verse 11. Notice that it says, and be famous in Bethlehem. Rachel and, and, and Leah were famous in Israelite history. And guess what we're studying 3,000 years later? We're studying about Ruth, who was also famous. A person who would have been forgotten in history 
makes a or finds a kinsman redeemer. He finds her and he redeems her and he restores her and he gives her great wealth and a family. And now she has great fame. She's even in the Bible in the lineage of Jesus Christ, a woman who formerly was a curse. One day, friend, you're going to be walking on the streets of heaven and I verses of scripture come back and remind you that I was nobody in Grove and Florida. I was nobody in Centerville. I was nobody on Tuscanooga Island. But God saved me and now I'm walking on the streets of heaven. That's what our kinsman redeemer can do for us. Amen. Oh, what a thought. Then not only that, Ruth also received fruitfulness. Up to this time she had not had children. She was barren for whatever reason. Maybe just because her husband died too fast. We don't know. Now she gives birth in chapter 4. She gives birth to Obed, who was the father, grandfather of King David. Only that she received a future. What's your future look like? I've been a little long because of the interruptions in the birthday song. <laughs> what does your future look like? Without Jesus Christ, you have no future other than what you see in the very present. You have a future in hell in the same condemned state that you've always been in. You can choose to stay in that state if you wish, but there's a kinsman redeemer who wants to redeem you. How could you not say yes? How could you not love him? And I just want you to think about this one thought before I close. Of all that our kinsman redeemer is, and all that he did for both Ruth and what he's done for us. Do you think <coughs> I just don't want to miss Mary Helen? You're a wife. You're a wife. You got a husband back there. I don't know why you don't say it to you. Are you ashamed of her? <laughs> it actually plays into my story. <laughs> can you imagine? Can you in all seriousness, can you imagine that there was ever a moment after this story concludes that Ruth went around in Bethlehem? And apologized or was ashamed of Boaz? Do you think there was ever a time that she was embarrassed? Look at what he did for her. She was starving and desperate and destitute. A Moabitess that was condemned. And he redeemed her. He restored her life. He gave her a child and a lineage in Jewish history that led to the Messiah. Do you think she was ashamed of Boaz? <laughs> Absolutely not. <coughs> then why, friend, if Ruth is I, if you are, if you are Ruth, and Boaz is, is, if Jesus Christ is our Boaz, why then are we ashamed and make apologies for Jesus Christ who's done so much for us? Yeah. Why and how can you sit there on that chair Sunday after Sunday knowing that you need to be obedient to the Lord, claiming that you're a Christian, and be baptized as He commanded you to do, and testifying of all the greatness that He has done for you, how can you sit there and say week after week, I'm too shy? What you're really saying is, I'm ashamed. How can you be ashamed of a kinsman redeemer of <coughs> Jesus Christ? How can you apologize for someone who's done so much for you? Don't do it. When there's a time to speak up, remember you've been saved by Jesus Christ. Speak up and testify. When there's a time to, to, to give Him glory and praise, give Him the glory and the praise that He's worthy of because He is our kinsman redeemer. Amen. Amen. Don't you ever walk around again with your head in chain because of what you did in the past that was the curse. Don't you ever walk around again in, de, in, in defeat and in agony of spirit because of something that's uh, somebody said because you have been redeemed by a kinsman redeemer and your future, that's the point, is secure.